the first thing I want to do is just quickly look back at something that, you, that we often do with just the first order differential equation with non-constant coefficients and a driving term. And the reason to look at this, I, I remember learning the integrating factor and thinking briefly it was cool, but why did I learn it? What does it have to do with anything? It's a nice little example of superposition and how that applies in things and just some of the tricks you can do when you're given a more complicated equation. So the starting point is to consider the equation y prime of x plus p of x y of x equals zero. This is pretty straightforward because it's one we can just directly integrate. That p of x doesn't really mess anything up for us because I can write this as dy over y equals minus p of x dx, and I'm done, right? Assuming I can compute the integral of p of x, y of x just equals some constant e to the minus integral of p of x dx, and I can define that to be i and even if I can't do it analytically, I can do it numerically. I mean, I can solve the differential equation numerically as well, but at least in principle, I have a solution for any p of x. And conceptually, this is the sort of thing that comes up in a lot of quantum mechanics examples where you have some sort of exponentially decaying function um, and we're doing an approximation for tunneling or something. So it's a common thing to come up where you don't have a strictly constant here. You have to actually integrate something p of x. So that's, that's one way to do it. And when you think about this integral, you know, it's an indefinite integral, so I could, I could put an x up there and do like a p prime if I wanted and an x prime um, just to make it clear that what I'm left with is a function of x because it's an indefinite integral. Now, if I want to do the slightly more complicated case, where I have a q of x on the right-hand side. There's a few steps to putting this together. Um, let's keep in mind we're going to write y as a e to the minus i. i is defined up there. And our third piece is to just keep in mind, therefore, that di dx by definition is p of x. So these are our three building blocks. And a common idea in physics and solving differential equations and looking at physical situations is to look for what we call the total derivative. You really want to get used to thinking in terms of that. And one thing also, I mean, we're already in week six of the class and I hope you've noticed by now one of the things in my lecture style that I like to do. I try very hard to be very explicit about the ideas that we're using in a particular case that you're going to see over and over in physics. And so, you know, when you go back to listen to the lectures or when you look at your notes, when I highlight things like total derivative idea, put that in your list of what we call our bag of tricks. Students often complain, oh, that was a trick problem. Most of physics is trick problems. You want to have the list of tricks that we use so when you're faced with a new problem, you can go through which one of these tricks is the right one to use. So the total derivative we're going to look at here is d by dx of the quantity y of x times e to the i. Now, because it is a trick, initially you might not say, okay, well, why is that so useful? But let's see what happens. If I look at that total derivative, I get y prime e to the i plus y e to the i di dx. And what do you notice about this? And what else does this then look like? So this is p of x. So what does this equation look like? The original one with e to the i. So I have e to the i times y prime plus y p of x. Now, the equation I'm now trying to solve is this thing equal to q of x. So if I consider the following equation, e to the i 
y prime plus y p of x equal to q of x e to the i, and I call that f of x, then I have a situation where this thing is the result of a total derivative and it equals this thing. So what I can say now is d by dx of y of x e to the i equals q of x e to the i. Why has that just helped me? Why has creating a total derivative and doing it in this fashion allowed me to make progress with this problem? Because I can take my dx over here. This is purely a function of x. There's no y's in it. I can integrate this side. The integral of the total derivative is just the stuff here. And I'm done. I divide by e to the i and I have a solution. So if I do that, I see that y of x e to the i just equals the integral of q of x e to the i dx. And now I divide and y of x equals e to the minus i times the integral of q of x e to the i dx. Now this is my particular solution. Remember, I do always in general have to add back in the homogeneous solution. Because of course, if I take d by dx of that, I'm going to get zero and that doesn't affect anything. And so notice it's, it's in a closed form. I haven't found a generic function yet, but assuming that this integral and that integral can be done, I'll get an actual analytic form. But even prior to computers, integrals were things I had ways of estimating and I could approximate and do things with. So a couple of key pieces. Notice this is fundamentally a sense of superposition. I'm summing over something with q to the x. This is what we mean by the integrating factor. It's something I was able to multiply things by. I multiplied everything by e to the i and I got a total derivative so now I could just integrate it easily. And that's what we mean by finding a clever integrating factor. And so this is a case where it can be done very explicitly. I just wanted to show you that because it's a useful conceptual tool in some cases to get at some physics that you might not necessarily get at just by solving it, you know, brute force.